Okay, good. Good morning. I uh, just want to thank uh, Salvi and everybody else who joined uh, uh, this meeting today. Uh, Salvi is going to cover on colon anatomy uh, with special reference to endoscopists, what they need to know, uh, especially for trainees, as well as technicians and nurses. Uh, we'll be recording it and then posting this thing on a new YouTube for the sake of uh, others who could not make it today. And the YouTube channel is uh, free from any advertisement. It has no monetary gains. I'm grateful for you to allow us to record this. Uh, so we have done a, a little bit of uh, progress in our Zoom classes. Uh, today we'll be using a polling option uh, to test um, uh, test the uh, process in terms of uh, the cases that uh, Selvi will present and uh, let you answer the questions. Uh, and uh, this will help us uh, improve our learning process. So let me hand it over to Selvi. Okay, Raju, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining um, our Sunday endoscopy Zoom rounds. We're now up to class 14. We're very excited. As Raju said, we're making progress with each class and um, hopefully improving it uh, little by little. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm talking about colon anatomy and we'll have some clinical cases. Uh, as always, I wanna acknowledge my friend and mentor Raju for creating this um, forum and then inviting me to speak. Uh, Dr. Strohlein, the chair of our department um, who supports our education um, projects and Angela Deal, of course, our medical illustrator. She did all of the uh, illustrations in my uh, presentation today with the exception of two illustrations, and I won't have to point out which ones those two were. They will be very obvious to everybody. Of course, uh, Raju said that this is being recorded and will be on the YouTube channel. So we'll talk a little bit about normal uh, endoscopy anatomy of the colon. Um, and we'll at MD Anderson, we get a fair share of patients who've had surgery. Um, so as a fellow, it was always a little bit of a challenge for me to try to learn um, different post-surgical anatomy. So I thought I would um, go through that step-by-step um, step so people can have a good concept. And then I have some colon um, cases that I thought were very interesting, and that's where we'll get the audience participation uh, and people guessing what the correct diagnosis is. So um, Raju did the esophagus in Zoom class three. I, did, I covered the stomach in Zoom class five. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the small bowel in Zoom class 12, and today we're gonna cover the colon. So um, this is a, a, a diagram of the colon. So the colon at birth starts out to be about 30 centimeters long, but in adults, it grows to five times the size. So base almost five feet long. Um, it's only one quarter the length of the small bowel. Um, here is uh, the different uh, sections of the colon that can be recognized, at least from the outside, not necessarily from the inside, but we'll get to that in a moment. So starting at the most proximal end of the colon, you have the appendix um, and you have the cecum. So the cecum has uh, the largest diameter of the colon. It's seven and a half centimeters. And I know fellows um, and uh, will get consults for um, inpatients who have a dilated cecum or possible colonic obstruction. And so they'll say, you know, the cecum is so many centimeters. Well, you need to know what the normal is before you can tell if it's dilated or not. So normal is about seven and a half centimeters. After the cecum moving distally, you have the ascending colon. So the ascending colon then kind of ends at this first of two flexures. The first flexure is called the hepatic flexure. That's because the liver sits right here. And a flexure is simply kind of a sharp turn um, in the colon in order to continue along the lumen. The next um, part of the colon after the hepatic flexure is the transverse colon. Then your second flexure, which is the splenic flexure. And as you guessed it, it's because the spleen sits right here. Um, and from the splenic flexure, the colon descends down the descending colon to the sigmoid colon. And sigmoid just means S-shaped and it can become quite twisty, turny, and uh, challenge sometimes to navigate through. After the sigmoid colon comes the rectum. So the sigmoid colon is actually the narrowest part of the colon at only two and a half centimeters. So as you're navigating through that S-shaped colon, it is very narrow and it's, um, you know, it can be a challenge just because of the um, 
caliber of the lumen and also the twists and turns that you'll encounter. So um, a couple of unique features of the colon. Um, the first feature is the fact that they, it has these haustra. So haustra are just kind of these um, pockets or outpouchings of the colon. Um, and you can see those are characterized by mucosal folds on the inside of the colon. Um, and then the second feature is this um, tinea, tinea coli, it's called. So um, the two uh, muscle layers in the muscularis propria are the inner circular and the outer longitudinal muscle layer, very similar to the small intestine. So that was the um, belt and the sleeves concept that I talked about a couple weeks ago. So the outer longitudinal muscle layer actually coalesces to form these three longitudinal bands. So they're spaced about 120 degrees apart. That's what this, is, this image on the right is supposed to signify. Um, along that runs the length of the colon, the, along the long axis of the colon. It starts at the cecum and basically goes up until um, the proximal rectum. Um, so the house are these saccules and their contractions actually help to propagate chyme through the colon. I have a couple of stars here and that's basically to say when we're inside the colon and we're telling the nurses um, and text this is a descending colon polyp, this is an ascending colon polyp, it's kind of a guess. Uh, the only places where you can tell for sure where we are is in the cecum because it has these landmarks, the ileocecal valve and the appendiceal os and the rectum. Everything else is kind of a guess. If your scope is straight and you've just left a, an area that you're very sure of where you are, then you can say, well, this is this area or that area. But I wanted to kind of have that caveat there. So at, when we talked about the small bowel, the duodenum was parts of it were retroperitoneal and parts of the, it were within the peritoneal cavity. The same is true of the colon. So the ascending colon is actually retroperitoneal. Um, and the descending colon is retroperitoneal, which means it's kind of fixed in place. It's not going to move around on you too much. However, in sharp contrast, you have the transverse colon and the sigmoid colon. These are suspended from the anterior abdominal wall and the retroperitoneum by mesentery, but they're not fixed. They're actually freely mobile. So the transverse colon is the most mobile segment of the colon. It's transverse because it runs transversely or across your upper abdomen. Um, it drapes itself behind the anterior abdominal wall, and it's anterior, or it can be anterior to the stomach. So it's something to keep in mind when you're placing a PEG, a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy tube into the stomach. And the transverse colon is something you want to avoid. Um, so the sigmoid colon is also freely mobile and um, can, is actually susceptible to volvulus. So volvulus is just a twisting of the colon that can happen. Um, when the colon kind of through, goes through its peristaltic maneuvers, um, it can kind of twist on itself if it's not fixed in place. And of course, the rectum is below the peritoneal reflection. So it's, um, that's the location of that. So we'll talk, here's the cecum. So the cecum, as I said, is the widest diameter within the colon. So tumors can actually grow quite large before they start causing signs of obstruction. The cecum, again, is normally fixed in place by the mesentery and is non-mobile, but in 10 to 20% of the population, it can be mobile and it can cause a cecal volvulus, again, a twisting of the, of the cecum on itself. And this is especially true in women. So I wanted to show, again, just to show normal endoscopic anatomy so people can start recognizing these landmarks and um, on during a colonoscopy. And just my technique, which is not necessarily the right technique, but my way of kind of examining um, the cecum and ileum. So you identify the cecum by getting to the, um, by identifying the appendiceal os. Um, the appendiceal os and the first two pictures can look quite different in different patients. The third picture shows that you actually have to, it's nice to look deep inside the appendix safely because you can get polyps there. Um, this picture below, um, in the second row shows the floor of the cecum. So in terms of photo documentation, I take a picture of the appendiceal os, and then I also examine and take a picture of the floor of the cecum. When I take that floor of the cecum picture, I keep this appendiceal os as a reference point within the picture. Um, and then I also do an examination under NBI uh, with narrow band imaging. 
So um, here are pictures of the top two pictures are of the ileocecal valve. And as I mentioned in the small bowel class, I routinely examine um, the ileocecal valve and intubate it to get into the terminal ileum. I think it's an important practice to have and a good technique to develop over time. Um, so the ileocecal valve is kind of a fatty or lipomatous valve uh, fold within um, the cecum. And you're able to, in that first picture, see the two lips of the valve and intubating it would basically be putting the scope into um, the center of that valve and turning into um, the ileum. And as you can see, it's going to be at a, almost a right angle to the valve. Um, the second picture shows that this sometimes valves can be very redundant. That's not tumor. That's actually the ileocecal valve um, and maybe a little bit more challenging to intubate. Once you intubate the valve, you're in the terminal ileum, and um, we've talked about the small bowel, so I won't uh, mention any more about that. But it is important to examine it on every colonoscopy. Here's a picture of the hepatic flexure. So it's just a sharp turn. Some patients, it's much sharper than others, um, and it's characterized by this blue liver shadow. Um, and again, it may, it may be very obvious in some patients and quite subtle in others. So here's how I examine the right colon. So I'll examine um, the right colon under white light, looking very carefully behind each fold in a circumferential fashion from the cecum back to the hepatic flexure. Um, I may do this several times because colonoscopy has um, in the past not been as good at detecting right-sided colon lesions. Um, and I think by doing a more dedicated view of the ascending colon and the cecum, um, not just withdrawing through it quickly will actually help us. Um, make colonoscopy an even better procedure than it already is. So I also examine it under NBI a few times. And then the next thing I'll do is do a right colon retroflexion. I do try it in all of my patients as long as they're not extremely elderly or there's not any signs of inflammation of the colon. Um, and uh, by doing that, I'm able to examine behind the folds. Um, in this patient, um, the folds are kind of shallow, and so you probably could have gotten a good look just on an anti-grade view, but in some patients, the folds are quite deep, and it's good to take a look uh, on the back sides of the folds. And again, for the fellows, I would say if you retroflex, it's not just doing the maneuver and taking a picture, it's actually carefully examining the back sides of the folds, which will require kind of pulling the scope back, and you may end up when you straighten out the scope at the hepatic flexure, you may have fallen back to the transverse colon, but at least you will have examined the backs of the folds. So here's the transverse colon. It's supposed to be triangular shaped. In some patients, very triangular. In other patients, not so much. So um, again, you may not be uh, very uh, definitive in saying that it's a, a transverse colon polyp that you've removed. Here's the descending colon and the sigmoid colon. So the descending colon is pretty straight and the sigmoid colon is, um, can be quite tortuous. So one of the common findings in the descending and sigmoid colon are diverticulosis. These are just outpouchings in the um, colon. Um, just having the pockets means is called diverticulosis. Uh, it, you can be, these pockets can become inflamed, which is called diverticulitis. It's, um, if you're doing a procedure and you notice a little patch of inflammation in the left colon or sigmoid colon, and there are some diverticula in that area, that's generally what we refer to as um, SCAD or segmental colitis associated with diverticular disease. So here's some pictures we've all seen diverticulosis in the sigmoid colon. They can also occur in the right colon. So the picture on the right is um, ascending colon ticks. Um, the Poly the uh, diverticula in the right colon have a tendency to bleed because the wall of the ascending colon is thinner, um, and the diverticula in the sigmoid colon tend to get inflamed. Um, but what I tell my patients is more patients have diverticulosis than actually have problems from it. So these complications are not very common. We'll move down to the rectum. So uh, the rectum is basically from the anal verge, which is zero centimeters on your scope. Um, to about 15 centimeters proximal to the anal verge. The rectum lies below the peritoneal reflection, um, and there are actually three um, mucosal uh, semilunar valves or rectal valves. So there's the superior rectal valve, the middle rectal valve, and the inferior rectal valve. So let's, um, again, just to run through of how I examine the anal rectum. So um, the first picture is uh, the rectum, and you can see the three rectal valves there. Um, it's important to insufflate the rectum um, and then deflate it a little bit. And that way you'll be able to see very subtle flat lesions and not miss anything in the rectum. 
it's also important to examine circumferentially for that same reason. Um, you'll notice I have a cap on my scope, and this actually helps me um, do the procedure overall, but definitely when you're examining the anal rectum, I'll pull the scope back into um, towards the anal verge and take pictures. And um, as I'm pulling back, those are the, uh, the, you can see a lot, you can definitely see pathology um, within the uh, anal canal. The last thing I'll do is retroflex the scope in the rectum. Um, and by doing that, again, um, with fellows, it's not just retroflexing and taking a picture. It's a dedicated exam of that area. So it's important, you may have to pull, you may, it may take a few minutes. You may need to put air in, you may need to pull the scope back and forth a little bit, um, but you wanna see that dentate line, which is um, uh, marked by that arrow. Um, and then you'll see um, hemorrhoids or other pathology polyps, et cetera. The other thing that I do is after I've retroflexed is just twist the scope, um, torque it back and forth. So you're able to see um, the uh, rectal mucosa behind uh, the scope itself. And that's, these are just pictures of that. So um, here's some uh, pathology. So as you're pulling the scope back here, we can see this patient has internal hemorrhoids because the hemorrhoids are proximal to uh, the dentate line. Here is a normal anal verge. Um, here are internal hemorrhoids again. Here is external hemorrhoids. So again, part of the colonoscopy is, the first part of the colonoscopy is to examine uh, the anal verge and the perianal area for pathology. Um, and here is a patient with an external hemorrhoid. Uh, these are skin tags. These are much more common than external hemorrhoids and they're basically external hemorrhoids that have decompressed. If you see a patient with external hemorrhoids, it is important to palpate them, make sure that they're not uh, firm or indurated to make, uh, and that they're, the hemorrhoids are not thrombosed. So here's another finding. Um, this is a patient with an anal fissure, um, which is examined uh, through the scope with the cap on. So that's uh, all I wanted to say about uh, colon anatomy and colonoscopy techniques. Um, unless there's any pressing questions, we'll uh, keep moving on. We'll have time for questions at the end as well. So here's physiology of the colon. What does the colon do? Um, and I only have one slide uh, on this um, because the small intestine um, talk was very uh, heavy and dense with information. And that's because the small intestine is really the workhorse of the GI tract when it comes to uh, digestion and absorption of nutrients. But the colon plays a part as well. So the colon is responsible for absorption of water and electrolytes. 90% of the water in the chyme has been absorbed by the small intestine, but another 90% of the approximately one liter per day that's delivered to the colon gets absorbed by the colon, uh, and the rest uh, leaves as uh, stool. Um, so the ascending colon is responsible for absorbing the remaining water and uh, key nutrients like uh, electrolytes. Um, in order to solidify the stool. The descending colon is responsible for storing the stool. The sigmoid colon contracts and increases intraluminal pressure and propels the stool into the rectum. And the rectum is basically a reservoir. It holds the stool until um, it's time for elimination. So when, you, uh, when we get to post-surgical anatomy and you see that certain parts of the colon are missing, um, you can kind of figure out what kind of problem the patient's gonna be um, experiencing based on the part of the colon that's uh, missing. So the colon also absorbs uh, vitamins B and K and biotin that are um, produced uh, by uh, the bacteria in the stool and um, it uh, forms and propels waste. So we'll move on now to post-surgical anatomy. So this is a patient with a coloanal anastomosis. Uh, when you do your digital rectal exam on these patients, sometimes it can be very narrowed and, some, and you have to do um, a digital dilation very slowly before it'll allow um, scope passage. But you can see that the anastomosis is very close to uh, the anal verge here. So um, here is a picture of um, a, a colostomy. So this up here is a, a patient who had um, their possibly lower distal rectal cancer um, and had what's called an APR or an abdominal perineal resection. And that part of their colon is gone. And so the rest of their colon gets diverted up to a stoma on the abdominal wall. Um, and that is uh, a colostomy. So because there's stool coming out of a colostomy, these patients need a bowel prep before they can present for their colonoscopy. 
down in the pictures below are ileostomies. So these are patients, for example, my patients with FAP that have had a total proctocolectomy. That means their entire colon and the rectum is gone. And so the small intestine is brought up to a stoma on the abdominal wall. And this is where um, their chyme will get um, expelled. So it's not solidified. It's still quite liquid, and that's what they're going to be um, producing. So on the far right is a picture of a normal ileostomy, a normal stoma. And the other two pictures on the left are um, tubular adenoma at the stoma site. So because um, and it, this is an ileostomy, this patient does not need a bowel prep because they're not producing stool. So here is an example of a, a patient who had rectal cancer or sigmoid cancer, and they have a low anterior resection or LAR. And the arrows point out the anastomosis from uh, the colon to the rectum. Uh, and sometimes it's just a, a fold that's um, a little white and scarred. And sometimes you'll see some surgical suture material as you see um, here in this uh, picture on the left. This is a patient who had um, a uh, uh, right-sided colon cancer, for example, and had a right hemicolectomy. So um, this patient has an iliocolonic anastomosis. So um, here you see that um, there's a transition between the colon and the ileum. So it's important to examine that part of the colon uh, that is remaining near the anastomosis. It's important to examine the ileum. Generally, depending on the um, uh, technique that the surgeon used, uh, you can have, when you go straight into the ileum, this part will be blind, as it's shown up here on the uh, top right. Um, and in order to get to the neoterminal ileum for an end-to-side anastomosis, you'll have to pull the scope back, as the arrow is showing, um, more distally and make a sharp right turn in order to intubate the neoterminal ileum. Okay, so this is um, a, a diagram that I made um, to kind of help people visualize what a J pouch is. So when you hear about a J pouch reconstruction, it can either be um, colon to rectum or colon to anus, or it can be ileum to rectum or ileum to anus. So when you hear about an IPAA, it's an ileal pouch anal anastomosis. So the J pouch is basically, it's the shape of a J, um, and that extra short arm of the J is basically acting as a reservoir um, and helps hold stool because the rectum is no longer there. You can also have an IRA, which is an ileal rectal anastomosis. So here is an example of um, a colorectal uh, J pouch anastomosis. So the middle screen, middle um, picture on the screen shows the blind colon, and then the long arm of the J will take you up to the proximal colon. Here's a lady who had um, an ileoanal anastomosis in a J pouch. The, the first picture is um, the, the uh, anastomosis at the um, anus, and it was quite narrowed, and I had to do digital um, dilation in order to get the scope in. The second picture shows the anastomosis itself, and the bottom two pictures are the blind and the long uh, arms of the J. And with retroflexion, um, you can see that ileal mucosa is basically going all the way down to the dentate line. So this is an ileoanal anastomosis. So that basically um, brings us to the case discussion. Um, Raju, I don't know if you want to uh, stop and uh, get any questions at this point, or if you want to proceed with uh, the case discussion. Why don't you continue, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. Okay. All right. All right, so um, this is the first case. Um, so you go to endoscopy tomorrow morning, and your 8 o'clock um, endoscopy patient on your schedule is a 77-year-old woman with a history of transverse colon cancer. Uh, this was resected with a subtotal colectomy a year ago, and now she presents for her initial surveillance colonoscopy. So you see this lesion uh, located at 25 centimeters. And you feel like you can't get it completely with biopsy forceps in one bite or two. So you use a cold snare and you remove it uh, completely. So um, Raju, can you put up the poll question number one 
And uh, the audience, please select the best answer in the pop-up poll question. The answers are all anonymous, uh, so please give it your best guess. These are completely anonymous, so uh, take a guess, and we're all learning here. I don't think I guessed the right thing when I was actually doing the procedure and removing the polyp, so um, it's okay to be wrong. So three more to vote. Mm -hmm. Did you vote, Raju? I can't vote because I'm the polling master. Oh, okay. I don't think I can either, actually. Okay. So right. that's going to be two so, answers uh, that we're right. always going to so be missing. We will end the poll. Okay. And I will share the results. Okay. Okay. Can you see the results? We can see the results. So uh, some people thought it was a hyperplastic polyp, but most people thought it was either a serrated adenoma or a tubular adenoma. Those two answers are actually tied and nobody thought this was mucosal prolapse because why so would this be mucosal prolapse? Me, it, I yeah. would have put it for a hyperplastic polyp uh -huh. or a serrated adenoma, one of the two. Because yes, that's, that's a, probably what I thought also when I was doing right. the procedure and that's why I wanted to make sure I removed all of it um, if it was a serrated adenoma. Right. Because how would it, why would it be mucosal prolapse? This is like way up there, 25 centimeters, I said, yeah. right? Yeah, okay. uh, unless... Uh, uh, Unless I'm trying to trick people. Yeah. I would never do that though, Raju. Yeah. I would never do that. Right? Right. Right. Okay. So um, can you take the uh, poll away? Or I took it away. You took it away. Okay. Maybe I just need to close it on my screen. Okay. So let's see what the answer was. So the answer was actually mucosal prolapse, solitary rectal ulcer syndrome. And this is my uh, second drawing that I made. Um, it's terrible. Uh, I'm not a drawer. I'm a colonoscopist, really. I'm an endoscopist. But I wanted to give this idea of what exactly we're, we're dealing with. So solitary rectal ulcer syndrome is really a misnomer. It's wrong on every count. It does not have to be a solitary lesion. It can be multiple lesions. It does not have to be in the rectum. It can be in the sigmoid colon, as in this case. It does not have to be an ulcer because this is obviously not an ulcer. Um, it can present as a mass or as a polyp um, or a thickened fold. Um, and uh, maybe it's correct that it's a syndrome. I don't know. Um, but anyway, the etiology of solitary rectal ulcer syndrome or mucosal prolapse is unclear. Um, you can think of it as uh, the three Ps, PPP. It's increased anal pressure at straining it's paradoxical puborectalis muscle contraction and rectal prolapse. So when, and the drawing is supposed to, <laughs> it's a very sad little drawing now that I look at it. It looked great last night, but um, anyway. So um, the puborectalis muscle basically is a, acts as a sling. It attaches um, to the pubic bone and it maintains the um, resting anal rectal angle. So this puborectalis muscle needs to relax in order for defecation and elimination to occur. So if it's a paradoxical contraction, it does not relax, and that can um, certainly lead to um, rectal prolapse if the rectum is straining against uh, a, a difficult angle. Um, so on biopsy, and I don't have any biopsy pictures um, on this talk, um, but on biopsy, you would see fibromuscular obliteration of the LP layer. Um, and that's characteristic for uh, mucosal prolapse. Do you want to take questions um, uh, between cases or do you want to finish um, all of it, Raju, and then do questions? Uh, you can finish. Okay. So moving on to the next case, your next patient is a 74-year-old woman with a long history of reflux and Barrett's esophagus. She developed esophageal adenocarcinoma and uh, underwent endoscopic mucosal resection twice with persistent residual disease. Uh, these EMRs were not done at MD Anderson. Um, so, of course, she's planned for an esophagectomy in three days, but then she develops uh, hematochesia, rectal bleeding, and she presents to the emergency room. 
So the emergency room in um, their usual fashion have done a CT scan. Here's the CT scan. You guys can take a look at it. Okay. So I did a procedure on her, a colonoscopy, a flexible sigmoidoscopy, actually. Um, and these are the images from that. So this is um, audience poll question number two. What is the diagnosis here? Raju, can you pull up the second poll question, sir? Okay, what is your diagnosis? Is it diverticular bleeding? Is it inflammatory bowel, oh, bowel, inflammatory bowel disease? Is it ischemic colitis? Is it a bleeding colon cancer? What do you guys think? I think that's it. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, we have more uh, participants. Okay, I see. So what is your diagnosis? Diverticular bleeding, inflammatory bowel disease, ischemic colitis, or bleeding colon cancer? Okay. So uh, the poll is closed. And uh, the majority of people think that it's uh, ischemic colitis. So let's see what the answer is. So the answer is ischemic colitis. Uh, you guys were correct. So um, the colon arterial uh, supply is made up of the SMA, the superior mesenteric artery, the IMA, the inferior mesenteric artery, and the internal iliac arteries. So there's a lot of extensive, not a lot of extensive, just extensive collateral circulation, but there are certain watershed areas, they're called, where overlap uh, is not as great. Um, and these areas are the splenic flexure and the rectosigmoid colon. And this can be a board question, I would think, potentially. So colon ischemia can be related to occlusion, so thrombosis, either arterial or venous or it can be non-occlusive and just due to a low flow state. So this is actually more common in elderly patients and in females um, as our patient was. So we'll go over um, in a little bit more detail since I didn't say anything when we showed the CT scan and the endoscopic images. So the CT scan shows, um, and I don't know if you can see my um, arrow or not, but there's two big white arrows there that are showing this. So this is the splenic flexure, and there was a lot of um, mucosal uh, edema and a wall thickening, and there was actually some pericolonic fluid also noted at the splenic flexure. And you can uh, see that it's the splenic flexure because you can see a little bit of the spleen actually peeking out from behind it. So that's how the radiologist is able to identify what part of the colon um, they're looking at. So it's a very thickened, um, very thickened uh, sigmoid, uh, splenic flexure colon wall. So when I did the procedure, there was blood in the rectum. That's the first picture on the top left. But when I washed that away, the rectum was basically normal. As I um, advanced the scope up, again, using very minimal um, air insufflation, and actually I used carbon dioxide, not air, um, in order to reduce the risk of perforation, went into the uh, sigmoid colon. Um, and it's very kind of patchy involvement, a little bit of uh, mucosal uh, duskiness, a little bit of erythema, and then when I advanced up further in the bottom left picture, you can see that there's a flexure there and that is the splenic flexure. So the descending colon to transverse colon um, area that you can see shows that there's a lot more of this kind of purplish, dusky appearing um, colonic mucosa and it's, and it's patchy. It's not circumferentially involved. There's part, it, walls that are involved and walls that are not involved. So this is pretty classic of um, ischemic colitis. 
So these patients are generally treated conservatively. Um, you can give antibiotics, although there's no evidence to support that. Um, IV fluids um, and maintain their blood pressure and most patients will um, resolve spontaneously. Okay, we'll move on to our, the next patient on our endoscopy schedule. This is a 42-year-old man with no past medical history. He presented uh, with a partial small bowel obstruction. Um, so he, they treated that with NG tube decompression and a CT scan uh, was performed. Here's the CT scan. Give you a minute to take a look at that. Patient was prepped after his um, partial small bowel obstruction was at least clinically resolved. Um, and I did a colonoscopy on him. And here are the images. So these are images are in the right colon. Yes, these images are in the right colon, in the cecum, actually. Right. Going to launch the poll. Okay. So, what is your diagnosis? Um, is it ileocecal Crohn's with a pericolic abscess? Is this ileocecal carcinoma with a pericolic abscess? Is this cecal diverticulitis with an abscess? Is this actinomycosis with an abscess? What do you guys think it is? got this mass-like lesion. Something's happening on a CT scan. He has no past medical history. What could this be? It's a young guy, 42. Okay, so the results are back, and people think this is an ileocecal carcinoma with a pericolic abscess. Let's see what the right answer is. So this is adeno invasive, poorly differentiated, arising from the cecum. Um, it was actually arising in a tubular villus adenoma with high-grade dysplasia. So it basically occupied the entire cecum. It was very difficult for me to identify the appendiceal os. Um, I was able to see um, on one of the previous pictures I showed um, the ileocecal valve. I tried to intubate the ileocecal valve, um, as I uh, keep telling everybody else to do. But it was difficult. I mean, I was able to visualize some, you know, um, ileal mucosa, some villi, but I was not able to advance the scope through um, into the terminal ileum. So it was basically um, blocked off. And as you can see on the CT scan here, um, the arrow shows that the, um, there's a mass in the cecum. And actually, you can see um, where the small bowel is um, uh, entering, the terminal ileum is entering the um, cecum. There's also, that is also blocked. So this patient had um, ca cancer that was arising from the cecum that was actually growing into the terminal ileum. Um, and this is what was causing his partial small bowel obstruction. He had a very distal uh, small bowel obstruction and he had um, clinical symptoms from that. Okay, we'll move on to the next patient. This is your 11 o'clock patient on your endoscopy schedule before uh, you're getting your lunch break. This is a 77-year-old man with a history of prostate cancer. Uh, he was treated with radiation therapy. He developed uh, rectal bleeding and rectal pain nine months after finishing his uh, radiation therapy. Uh, he had been treated outside with local therapy, so 5-ASA or mesalamine suppositories without any relief of his symptoms. Um, he had gone, undergone a flexig and a colonoscopy and a rectal ultrasound done outside of MD Anderson. Um, and he is uh, on your endoscopy schedule. So when you put the scope in the rectum, this is what you see. And what is your diagnosis? Raju, we can launch poll question number four. Do you think this is a Crohn's disease with a fistula? Is this radiation damage? Is this a new rectal cancer? Or is this 
lymphogranuloma venereum infection, LGV infection. What do people think this is? So I know these questions are all kind of patients with cancer based, but um, I think they still have some relevant teaching points and patients with cancer get scopes um, and follow up done uh, many other places. So I think these are uh, common enough problems that um, they are applicable to uh, people everywhere, not just in uh, a cancer center. Okay, so uh, most people think that this is radiation damage, and I did lead you down the garden path. I mean, uh, but this, that's exactly what it was, rectal ulcer with proctopathy um, or radiation proctitis due to um, the radiation treatment that he got for his prostate cancer. So um, just in terms of the bleeding uh, from these uh, rectal telangiectasias or radiation proctitis, um, that can be just be treated with uh, either APC or uh, formalin or uh, suppositories or uh, sucralfate enemas. Um, so he was actually treated with mesalamine enemas um, or suppositories, and it didn't really help him. Unfortunately, he has um, another more serious complication of his pelvic radiation. Um, in addition to the radiation uh, proctopathies, he has a, a large rectal ulcer. And we think that this is related to uh, the radiation treatment in itself. Um, he did not give me a history of any outside APC uh, treatment, but certainly APC treatment can also cause uh, ulceration and fistula formation. So always uh, best to be very careful about this. So after he had um, this procedure done, uh, we ordered an MRI of his pelvis um, and the MRI of the pelvis um, actually shows a contained perforation in the pelvic sidewall uh, and it's been walled off. So his next step was he was referred to surgery um, and he underwent an, a diverting loop colostomy just in order to divert the fecal stream away from that rectal ulcer um, in order to allow it time to heal. Um, and he is planned for hyperbaric oxygen therapy for rectal wound healing. Uh, the surgeon didn't feel that primary hyperbaric oxygen therapy would help uh, this patient uh, heal uh, the rectal ulcer fast enough. Um, and so the loop colostomy or diverting the rectal stream uh, should help. Okay. Um, we'll move on to the next uh, patient on your endoscopy schedule. This is a 36-year-old man who's referred for a colonoscopy. Um, he had some recent imaging study, he said, that showed a rectal, rectosigmoid lesion. He has no family history of colon cancer and, of course, has never had a colonoscopy before. So here are the images. Um, this is in uh, the proximal uh, end of the rectum. This lesion can be seen from the anal verge. So take a look at these uh, images and um, kind of tell, figure out what, what kind of uh, lesion this is. So here is his uh, scan that he had done outside. So Raju, can you pull up um, question number five for the audience poll? What do you guys think this lesion is? Is it rectal cancer? Is it rectal carcinoid tumor? Is it rectal metastasis or a rectal lipoma? Okay, so the poll results are back and it's evenly split between rectal carcinoid tumor and rectal lipoma. So let's take a look at the answer. So this was a rectal neuroendocrine tumor uh, is actually what it was. So I think people correctly recognize that this was a submucosal lesion um, and uh, it's because the overlying mucosa is more or less normal appearing. Um, and here it is in uh, white light and with NBI. So this was actually, I, I played a little bit of a trick on you. I had this information that I'm showing you here um, before I did the procedure, um, but this is a 36-year-old man with known metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. 
uh, the dotatate scan uh, is uh, what I showed uh, earlier. And it showed uptake in the rectosigmoid colon with multiple hepatic mets. So he actually has metastatic disease. So whenever you see these submucosal lesions, it's good to take bite on bite biopsies. Um, and that's what I did. You take a bite and then you go exactly in that same place as best as you can to take additional bites. And, day, and doing um, jumbo biopsy forceps is um, always helpful uh, from the rectal lesion. And the biopsy showed well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor of intermediate grade. Uh, we talked about neuroendocrine tumors, I think, in the last um, uh, in this small bowel Zoom class. So these uh, tissue samples stained positive for chromogranin and synaptophysin. Uh, and had a low mitotic index. So the dotatate scan has, um, has basically replaced the octreotide scan. Um, it's a lot more sensitive, and um, they're using this as the contrast agent in combination with a PET CT. So you're going to have normal uptake in the liver and the kidneys and the bladder, as you can see here. Um, but the arrow shows that there's uh, uptake in the rectosigmoid, which is what prompted this patient to get referred. OK, your next patient. Um, you, the, uh, is uh, a 77-year-old woman with a very remote history of breast cancer. Um, she had a PET scan, which showed, again, uptake in the rectum. Uh, her mother had colon cancer around age 50 to 60, and this patient's last colonoscopy was eight years ago. Uh, so you go in and you see this lesion on the left in uh, the sigmoid colon, um, and you know that's going to be an EMR. So you tell, I told my team, start getting ready for an EMR. Um, so they were getting uh, all of their um, equipment ready. Um, and as I'm going up the colon, I see um, the lesions on the right. This is what I'm going to be asking you about in the poll question. Um, tiny, diminutive, uh, very kind of flat polyps in the transverse colon and in the cecum. So post-resection, um, I just did biopsies of the lesions on the right and the EMR um, methylene blue injection, hot snare, and there's a few more steps that um, are not relevant here um, for the lesion on the left. So this is the lesion that I want you guys to try to guess what it is. Um, so poll question number six, Raju, what is your diagnosis? Is this a lymphoid follicle? Is this a hyperplastic polyp? Is this a tubular adenoma? Or is this metastatic disease? What do you guys think this is? Looking at the image, surface vascular pattern, mucosal pattern, pit pattern. Just take your best guess. It's out of the patient, so you don't need to worry about it. OK, the results are back. Um, and it's evenly split between a hyperplastic polyp and a tubular adenoma. I think those are very reasonable guesses and probably what I would have suspected also when I was doing the procedure. However, these polyps came back as metastatic breast cancer which is incredible because her breast cancer was over 10 years ago. Um, but that's what these polyps were. And if anybody's wondering what that pedunculated polyp was that I removed from the sigmoid colon, rectosigmoid colon, that was a tubular villus adenoma. Um, and because of the EMR, uh, fortunately, the deep and lateral margins were free of adenoma. So very interesting. You never know what you're going to find. OK. Um, I think this is the last uh, case that we'll discuss. Um, so this is a 50-year-old woman with no cancer history. Uh, she has a history of TMJ and has a metal plate fixation in her uh, face, and she's not able to open her mouth very wide. Um, and anesthesia, of course, is concerned that she has a difficult airway, which she does. Um, and her outside, she comes to you because she says her outside GI a uh, physician recommended a colectomy. She doesn't want that, but she uh, wants you to take a look at what's going on. So here are the endoscopy pictures that I took. Some parts of the colon look OK. Some parts of the colon not so OK. 
So Raju, can you launch that last poll question, number seven? What is the most likely diagnosis for this patient? What do we think she has? So she's 50, and you saw uh, the polyps burden that she has. Place your bets. Unfortunately, we don't have a prize or anything, Raju, to give people. I think the learning is their reward, huh? Very dedicated people, Sunday morning, coming in and doing this. Thank you, everyone. OK, the results are back. and. Um, okay, so the, <laughs> the results are back, uh, and there's a tie between MYH polyposis and attenuated FAP. Um, okay, very good. So let's uh, see what she had. She actually had an attenuated version of uh, FAP, um, but the MYH polyposis, I think, would be a correct answer also. Um, so this is actually the second colonoscopy that I've done on this lady. Um, I had done one, um, I had done one uh, six months ago and there were, uh, you know, fewer polyps than she has now. She has many more larger polyps uh, on this exam. Most of the polyps are concentrated in the cecum and the ascending colon. I actually ended up removing um, just the larger polyps, uh, 25 of them on this exam, and they were all uh, tubular adenomas. So here, we'll go to, that's all I had. We'll go to this um, summary slide. So what we talked about today uh, is the normal endoscopic anatomy of the colon. We talked through some uh, per, common post-surgical anatomy that people in clinical practice will encounter. Uh, we ran through some of my clinical cases that at least I thought were interesting. Uh, and then for the fellows, um, I'm sharing my uh, golden rules of colonoscopy. Um, these are not uh, things that we had time to talk about, but we certainly could in the um, question and answer section here. Um, I always use a distal cap attachment on my um, colonoscope. I only use carbon dioxide for insufflation. I liberally use um, NBI uh, in order to examine the mucosa. I would encourage people um, to take your time in the cecum and ascending colon. This is where we miss uh, lesions and uh, interval cancers uh, occur. I use water during scope insertion, especially in the sigmoid colon to kind of distend the lumen over um, CO2. And then I always deflate uh, the colon before I uh, remove the scope. And that makes uh, the nurses in the recovery area very happy, which of course in turn makes me very happy. Um, I thank you all very, very much for your attention. You've been very kind and um, I will uh, stop talking and turn it over to Raju uh, to uh, see if there, we have any I, questions um, in the chat. I think there were a couple of questions. Thank you, everyone. Salary, thank you so much uh, for the beautiful presentation. What we will do is uh, we'll take some questions and uh, I would like to uh, uh, request you to stop uh, sharing your screen so that people can come on the screen and ask questions. Uh, uh, Roy actually, uh, asked a very interesting question, uh, being a passionate uh, advocate of uh, uh, contrast-enhanced uh, endoscopy. So, Roy, you want to talk about uh, uh, some of the chat you were sharing? Go ahead, Raju, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I, I think uh, I, I, I actually couldn't follow a couple of... Uh, of the images uh, like the breast cancer uh, metastasis because uh, uh, I, I wish I had been able to see more of the NBI and things like that. But uh, the breast cancer case, I think, uh, illustrate uh, um, what must have been a submucosal metastasis because uh, the 
metastasis cannot be mucosal. So it would have been interesting to see what the uh, pattern was on the uh, NBI. Do you have that? So um, great question. Um, a couple of points. One is the fact that I, I wanted to keep it as simple as possible for the polling, but it was metastatic breast cancer and there was some tubular adenoma uh, present in both of those uh, polyps. Um, I didn't share that. I did take NBI, but I didn't share it. So my apologies for that. Um, we uh, didn't have uh, histopathology availability for um, these slides uh, today. Um, but what they did was they, I assume they saw it in the submucosa, as you said, and they did a GATA3 stain on it and it was positive. Um, and so that was the reason why they called it uh, metastatic breast cancer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Any other comments, questions? So one of the things that uh, uh, Selvi stressed is the importance of uh, taking time uh, to make sure that you document that you have reached the cecum uh, by taking pictures of the appendiceal orifice and the uh, base of the cecum ileocecal valve, as well as uh, intubating the terminal ileum and taking the picture. Uh, if you actually get into trouble uh, with a legal case, uh, the best picture that would document without any doubt uh, is uh, to say that you reach the right side of the colon to the uh, cecum is a picture of the terminal ileum uh, showing villi. Uh, you know, nobody can doubt that, you know. Uh, sometimes the cecum is uh, deformed, especially in somebody who has had pelvic surgery or appendectomy or any of those things. And uh, uh, in order to show a classic uh, cecal picture is difficult, but you can convince everybody that you reach the uh, right side of the colon uh, to the proximal column by taking a picture of the terminal ileum with the lie. So when I go into the ileum, I not only take the pictures uh, of the villi, but I also want to make sure that it is a very clear picture by trying to put in some water and show the villi under the water. So something to keep that thing in mind. Roy, any other comments? You know, you are the expert in colonoscopy. No, I'm good, I'm good. But the fellows need to learn. You know, this is uh, basically directed towards fellows. I think um, trying to uh, talk about the surface classification, especially for uh, the neoplasms uh, using uh, some kind of a standard. Uh, in here, uh, we usually use the nice classification is good. Um, I think... Um, so that uh, will be your talk uh, sometime next week. Okay, thanks. Not <laughs> next week, Raju. Not no, next I week. Give, <laughs> give him more than one week. Oh my gosh. No, 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 no. I, I, I encourage Actually, you all to uh, think about it in that context. And uh, it will make uh, life easier if you think it in uh, frameworks. And that nice classification certainly gives uh, one framework. Right. So we, Roy actually created, Roy and Tanya created a beautiful slide set or educational slide, slide set uh, on a nice classification of various uh, polyps, you know, white light, you know, uh, magnification endoscopy and uh, chroma endoscopy pictures. Uh, maybe I think uh, 40 or 50 slides uh, that we could actually go over. And um, Roy and myself have been discussing about this to help the fellows. Uh, so we will uh, figure out uh, and set that up for one of these uh, weeks in the next coming uh, few weeks. So it will be a series of uh, 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 polyps. Uh, I think uh, we will create a poll, poll uh, polling uh, like this one. Unfortunately, the polling of Zoom would allow only 10 questions. So that's the, there's a limitation there. Uh, but otherwise, I think uh, this polling went well. Uh, it, it is uh, educational. Uh, and I've, learned, I've certainly learned a lot. 
Thank you for working out the details on how to do polling. Right. It, it's good. Actually, you know, these things, uh, they, they work well when you have, you know, one presenter and one uh, a backup guy or a sidekick to run the poll. Uh, otherwise, it is very hard for the same person to do multiple things. Uh, I see Sylvia uh, sign in there. Uh, Sylvia, let me... Uh, I request you to make some comments. Hello. Greetings. Go ahead, Sylvia. Nice to meet you, and it was a great presentation. Thank you I, very much. I have... Congratulations. My question is, um, regarding the case of new dye age polyposis uh, versus uh, family, uh, attenuated uh, FAP, um, I don't think that endoscopic findings are very helpful. We can uh, have a suspicious of a genetic syndrome, but before genetic analysis is performed, we can't differentiate endoscopically between the two entities, to my knowledge. Am I correct? You're 100% correct. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's absolutely impossible because it's just tubular adenomas. Exactly. Um, and it's very difficult to tell the difference between mute YH associated polyposis, FAP or attenuated FAP, honestly, um, based on an endoscopic exam. So um, for future, we'll not use those options um, in the poll. Um, but you're absolutely correct. Yes, ma'am. And in, in my experience, um, the patients with a mute IH polyposis are diagnosed at a bit older age. It's about yes. 50, 60. Yes. And the um, attenuated FAP patients are a little bit younger. It would be something like 30, 40 years uh, old. Yes, certainly. That, that can certainly be true. Okay, this thanks a lot. True. You're very welcome. Inviting. Thank you for, yes, no, thank you for your comments. So Raju, um, in the last couple of minutes, we have a couple of comments. Um, one comment from Azmin Bhatt, who uh, said that if there's a high suspicion for SSAs, that's also rated adenomas in the right colon, it's important to have good communication with the pathologist to confirm the diagnosis. Um, and uh, Joseph said, for fellows, always be careful to interpret inverted diverticula correctly and not mistake them for a sessile polyp. Don't do an EMR or biopsy on those. And I would just add that if you do that, I would put a, a clip on there just to make sure um, that uh, there's no uh, problems afterwards. And he just uses NBI and water jet to, to kind of push, see if it can revert, push it back in uh, or push it back out rather. Um, and sometimes the circular rings around the base of the polyp slash diverticulum is a, is a good clue. I think those are all very valid and uh, important points. Any other comments, Joseph, that you wanna add to that? You can unmute yourself. Oh no, that's uh, that's exactly the. Uh, I think I think that's an important point because I, I actually had a uh, several months ago I had a, a patient with without those circular rings, mm -hmm. and I was almost ready to, to inject an EMR and then um, and didn't have those circular rings. Yeah. Um, so I sat on it for a little bit. I, I um, infused water, mm -hmm. and uh, and part of the water jet. Uh, actually was targeted right at the center, such that Perfect. it actually inverted right back. It popped right back, and that's when I knew, oh, that was a close call. So oh. they, and they may not have those rings, so that, you know, uh, so yeah. there's always, I was want to make sure there's, um, there's some backup ways to assess for those. Right, I think those are great comments. That's uh, super. I think uh, I'm glad that you bring this thing up uh, for the sake of uh, uh, fellows or for the sake of anybody doing colonoscopy, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it is very hard to differentiate whether it is uh, a diverticulum or a diverticulum with a polyp, but you can actually differentiate an adenoma uh, from a little bit of crypt distortion that we see uh, when I say crypts, uh, uh, the pits uh, being a little bit distorted with either hyperplastic polyp or something, especially when the diverticulum prolapses. When the diverticulum prolapses, that mucosa gets hit a little more, so there may be some distortion. But adenoma, you should be able to 
uh, figure out. And uh, uh, one thing is, when, if you have an adenoma in a diverticulum that has prolapsed out, that is probably an easy area to re really remove. Uh, and you could do that by uh, injecting a generous amount of submucosal saline uh, and lift, uh, lift it up and then you cut it and uh, make sure you close it with clips. And if you think in your mind that you are probably cutting a diverticulum, uh, even if it is a remote doubt, uh, make sure that you put uh, multiple clips and secure it. You know, you would not get into unnecessary trouble by doing that. Uh, let me ask Roy what, what his thoughts are, or maybe Sylvia can comment. I think uh, we need to talk about uh, the anatomy, uh, especially the microanatomy. Uh, you know that uh, the lines that we see when we image the surface of the colon, those lines that are going uh, perpendicular to our scope, those lines actually don't have names. They are the, called the innominate uh, grooves. Uh, and they are very important because anything that has the lines uh, crossing uh, will not have an adenoma uh, in it. So uh, we use uh, the presence of these lines uh, very frequently uh, as we look for the flat lesions. Uh, and uh, what uh, Joseph was talking about is the circular lines uh, that goes into, uh, that is at the rim of a diverticuli. And uh, the circular lines, of course, are present as if you look down into the diverticulum. Um, and uh, just the presence of these lines should assure you that there is actually no neoplasm there, whether it is at the neck or whether it's inside. So uh, try to uh, 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 keep this frame in your mind that anything that has the lines crossing it will not have a neoplasm. I don't have an example to just uh, uh, flash it on this uh, forum, uh, but uh, I'm sure everybody has seen these lines, uh, but uh, the uh, use of it in the detection of the flat lesion is not very well talked about. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Uh, for the sake of uh, first year fellows and fellows in general, I would like to make one comment uh, that is important to, to keep in mind. Uh, when you are about to start the colonoscopy, you're going to insert your finger into the anal canal to lubricate the anal canal with a little bit of uh, uh, lubricant. But uh, make sure that as part of that examination, you should have in your mind that I'm also screening for anal cancer. So if somebody comes in with a little bit of rectal bleeding, you think it is hemorrhoidal bleeding, but uh, anal cancer is often uh, not diagnosed uh, at the right time because uh, people don't do that uh, uh, digital examination properly. Uh, what's the correct way to do a digital examination? Uh, you want to make sure that you rotate your finger uh, 360 degrees in the anal canal, trying to find uh, any induration. Uh, normal anal canal is soft. Uh, a little bit of uh, induration, uh, you should be suspicious and you should examine that anal canal either with an anoscope or with the cap at the end of the scope. Uh, typically, we put a cap about one to two millimeters beyond the rim of the endoscope for most colonoscopies. But if you want to examine the anal canal, what I try to do is, after I finish my colonoscopy, when I'm coming into uh, examine the anal canal, I do two things. I put in water uh, to just uh, gently open up the anal canal and examine. But if I think that I have to examine uh, a little more in detail for any suspicious lesions, I take my scope back out and uh, pull the cap out for about three to four millimeters out. Uh, so that it almost acts like an anoscope. And then uh, that long barrel will help you stay uh, outside the anal canal and gently open up a larger area to examine. Uh, so keep in mind, because anal can cancer is something 
that is uh, uh, subject to delayed diagnosis because we really uh, do not do a proper 360 degree digital examination. And the other thing is when you're coming out of the uh, rectum, think that you have an opportunity to screen for anal cancer. So look for uh, the papillomas or other things that happen in the anal canal uh, carefully and uh, make sure that you take pictures of the anal canal as you come out of the rectum. Raju, right. excellent points. Um, I think Joseph may, going back to the uh, rings around the diverticulum, Joseph uh, had a picture that he was gonna try to share. Um, I said, uh, okay, for multiple participants to share. So Joseph, can you try sharing your screen and see if it works? Sure, yeah, yeah let me see here, okay. Okay, can everyone see the screen here? We can. Um, is there any way for you to make it bigger? Oh, yes. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Let me see if I can uh, zoom in. Okay, so this is exactly the case I was talking about. I made sure I took some good pictures um, at the time. Uh, let's see. All right, can everyone see this? Yes. Yes. So okay. if you look at the top, uh, yeah. top corner, uh, if you think about the, uh, that as a polyp, at the top corner and at the, the northeast, you see those grooves. Right there, right? Right, yeah. right. When yeah. you see those grooves, you have to worry. And uh, when you look at your NBI image, you still have round dots. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm glad that you did uh, you know, water jet and uh, documented it. Now, when you do the water jet, you have much more well-defined uh, rings of uh, around the uh, diverticulum. Right, especially at first, it looked like this was very well demarcated as opposed to a ring. Yeah. Uh, it, but on MBI, it did not the add in, uh, the pit pattern did not appear to be adenomatous, so I was very suspicious, right. yeah. and right. I was glad I was able to get capture this picture there. So, all right, thanks. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. Good job, Joseph. All right. Uh, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate uh, Salvi's uh, beautiful presentation and uh, everybody's input. Uh, thank you, Asmin, for bringing us uh, the lessons you learned from Dr. Powell. You know, he's a great teacher. I uh, hope you all have a nice uh, Sunday and we'll meet next week. I'll bring a colonoscopy EMR case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sylvia, are you supposed to, are you planning to make a comment, Sylvia? No. Thank you so much. Oh, I don't you. have additional comments. Great initiative. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We, we would look forward to hearing from you and maybe learning from you one of these uh, weeks. It would be my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Roy. Thanks, everybody.